let me just talk a bit about kind of, uh, and look, I, I agree with everything uh, Brenton just said, especially the stuff about me. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I think politics is really important. And it's so easy, I think, so easy to say that people don't like politicians and they don't like politics. But frankly, you can't do democracy without politics. So, you know, I'm, I like democracy. Uh, which follows for me that therefore I like politics. Now, politics means many things, but ultimately politics is the art of both persuading people, but plenty of people who aren't politicians know how to persuade someone. But politicians have to do something else. They have to get the numbers, right? They have to get the numbers to get pre-selected into parliament, or in, 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 to become a candidate. That's not me, because my battery went flat. Um, so they have to get the numbers to get pre-selected. And without a majority of their party wanting them to be their candidate, they don't get in. And they need to get the numbers in their electorate, whether that's uh, at, a, at, a, at an electorate level, House of Reps, or in the Senate. And then if they are successful in getting pre-selected and they're successful in getting elected, their job, strangely, we don't talk about this much, their job is to show up in Parliament House and vote for legislation. That's actually the job of a politician. Right? For, for, for an X year term, three federal, your job is to vote for or against legislation. And quite simply, an idea only becomes a law when a majority of politicians in the lower house and a majority of politicians in the upper house vote for it. And that, obviously that's pretty banal. It's a bit hard to stretch that into a book. <laughs> uh, but we did it. But we did it. <laughs> The reason this simple truth is, I think, underexplored, despite the acres of newsprint dedicated to our political process and the role of the crossbench, is that the crossbench matter in one circumstance. Whenever the government of the day and the opposition of the day are implacably opposed, then in order to, quote, get the numbers, you're going to have to persuade people on the crossbench. This is what our constitution spelled out. This was the plan. This is exactly what is expected in a Westminster democracy. So one of the points we make in the book is that it's the major parties that make the crossbench powerful. Right? Full stop. <laughs> Nick Xenophon, one vote of 76 in the Senate, can achieve nothing. You don't get to be Nick Xenophon and walk in one morning and say, I am in balance of power. So I want this. That's not how it works. But when one party needs that one last vote to get the 39 they need to turn an idea into a law, then if you're that last person, then when Kevin Rudd rings up and says, so do you read in the newspaper, we're going to have this $42 billion stimulus package, I assume you'll be supporting it. Someone like Nick Xenophon gets to say, oh, you should, probably should have called first, mate. Because <laughs> actually, what, what do you get for the Murray? 900 million. I'd like 900 million bucks for the people who put me here. You can have your 42 billion, yeah, you can have it right now, right after I get my 900 million for the people who put me here from South Australia. Would you like something for Queensland? No. No. <laughs> South Australia will do. <laughs> But think about it. Right? That's their job. And if they do it well, they deliver something for their constituents. Now, whether it and, and, and getting that last vote is always frustrating. I think one of the most important points we make in the book, again, pretty obvious but underexplored, whether it's the Democrats and the GST or Mal Colston and Telstra or Brian Harrodine and Telstra or the Greens and the Carbon Price, and this is what always happens. Now, what always happens is when the government of the day, and for 27 of the last 30 years, the government of the day has not had a majority in the upper house, when the government of the day wants to pass a bill through the upper house, then it needs the support of either the Labor Party, which happens often, or, well, sorry, if it's a Liberal government, they need Labor opposition, or the crossbench. And if you can't count to 39, then you don't get your bill. Um, I told this story on, on, on Late Line the other night, but I'll tell it again. It sums it up pretty easily. 
Uh, when I worked for Natasha Stop the Spoiler, I was her chief of staff uh, when the Democrats were in balance of power. And Peter Costello wanted to uh, increase the co-payment on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Basically want to make medicine dearer for poor people. Uh, on budget night, the Democrats said they'd oppose it. The next day, Labor said they'd oppose it, uh, which basically meant either it wasn't going to happen, a bit like hockey's co-payment, or they were going to have to negotiate, either with the Democrats, who I was working for at the time, or with Labor. So a couple of weeks passed, and we went off and had a chat with Peter Costello at some point, and um, we got a very long, very boring, 45-minute flip chart presentation <laughs> of the Intergenerational Report. You remember the Intergenerational Report? <laughs> Sounding familiar? There's a lot of people on the hill would do well with a bit of history. Look, Richard, cost of ageing. Oh, look, lines going up. Are you scared? See the lines going up and up and up. And if we don't charge poor people more for their pills, the lines keep going up. <laughs> Nobody likes a line going up, so give us a co-payment. So after about 45 minutes, Natasha said, well, thank you, Treasurer, for your time. We've taken up enough of it. You know, we, we better be off. Quite polite, really. Um, and he said, well, but what are you going to do? You know, are you going to support the bill? She said, no. But look at the lines. <laughs> but he didn't say look at the lines. He said, look at the numbers, Natasha. Look at the numbers. And she said, I have, Peter. And you don't have them in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't be getting your bill for it. <laughs> and his face went white. Because after 45 minutes, he remembered why we were there. <laughs> well, no kidding. He was terrible at it. Now, we met Howard a couple of weeks later. And I won't tell that story with a camera rolling, but I couldn't wait to get out of the room. It was the most persuasive person I've ever been in a room with. Because he only wound up in the Prime Minister's office for one reason. They want something. And a good politician who not only wants something, but as Prime Minister can pretty much give you anything you want, is a pretty persuasive person to be in a room with. And I thought at the time, poor Meg Lee's had no chance. I did, because the co-payment was kind of trivial. The GST was Howard's whole thing. You know, and, and if you ever saw this, the ABC documentary on it, you know, Howard admits, here's how I threw on the full charm. And here's the thing, and I'll wrap up on this point, that's the job. <laughs> the role of Prime Minister is not to wake up in the morning and have a brain fart and then we all act on it. We elect 226 people to the Parliament every three years. And if we just want to do what Prime Ministers want to do, then let's get rid of 225 of them. Seriously. If you don't think that parliamentarians showing up with their own either self-interest or their or, or their electorate's interest is doing anything, well, let's ditch it. But as long as we've got a parliamentary system, then the skill of getting the numbers in both houses of parliament is actually the job of a politician. So it's interesting, since we've written this book, it's, Brett's going to hold it up again. <laughs> Signed copies available after time. Uh, Exceptional discount. <laughs> um, since we've written this book, uh, so I'll go back to it. One of the main points of the book is that this is a, it's ever been thus. Right? This is what the Constitution set out to do. Tony Abbott's not the first Prime Minister to have his ambitions foiled in the Senate. There's nothing new about this. But I was kind of ill prepared for the question, well, how come we've noticed then, Richard? And how come we're all paying so much more attention? So I only thought of this answer recently. I don't know if Brenton's heard it. Um, and that is, I think, a combination of two things. One, partly, Clive Palmer, the kind of most extroverted politician perhaps we've ever seen, <laughs> well, he drew a lot of attention to the Senate. Right, and the Senate, you know, I've been trying to tell people, hey, the Senate's important for years. I haven't got far. <laughs> all right, Clive got people to notice. That's a part of it. And I think Tony Abbott is the worst negotiator with the Senate that's ever been Prime Minister. <laughs> no, I do. I, the, 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 the school board says I'm right. His yeah. opening, so, opening gambit is to negotiate the illegitimate. Yeah, he, 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 he sought election promising to never do a deal with a minor party. But the dude's in coalition with the Nats. <laughs> 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 no, it doesn't make any sense. 
So, but so here's my point. At a, at a time when we've kind of got the worst Senate performer ever, we've actually noticed the Senate more than ever. And the combination of those two things is, I think, driving a lot of this sort of chaos narrative. Um, and, and to wrap up, Brenton might want to say a few more words, but my, my final point would be um, Malcolm Fraser, who, you know, let's face it, you can't change the country if you can't change yourself. Uh, I, I met with Malcolm Fraser a month ago. He was thinking of setting up a new political party. Uh, that's been reported. Uh, he was consulting with people about the platform for that party, and it was pretty interesting. I don't know what will come of that. It's not my story to tell, others might. Um, but Malcolm Fraser became Prime Minister because the Liberal Party destroyed a government in the Senate. Well, let's be clear, who created the chaos that led to the dismissal? Well, the Liberal Party. All right, you know? And then we're really now say, oh, well, now you're in government and the Senate's giving you a bit of a hard time. They won't pass your brain parts quickly. <laughs> no, what we need the context here. You know, this is what the Senate was set up to do. If you don't want to have a Senate, let's ditch one. Have a referendum if you really want to get rid of the upper house. Where are the people? Where's the business community saying, oh, this is terrible Senate obstructionism. It really makes life hard for our friend Tony Abbott. So let's get rid of the Senate. And next time there's a Labor Prime Minister, I promise not to complain when they roll their agenda through straight away. It just doesn't make any sense. We put the Senate there to stifle the power of executive government. If you don't want to stifle the power of executive government, then save ourselves a lot of time and money and scrap it. I think it would be a terrible idea. But unless we do that, then we need to work with it as it is. And you know, I for one am pretty glad that the crossbench are a bit recalcitrant at the moment. But you know, that's that's not the point. The point is, do you want to have one or don't you? And I definitely do.